Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Brian Lynn. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up, Andrew Smith presents Ask a Teacher. We also have Words and Their Stories from Ana Mateo. And we close the show with An American Story. But first... A workshop in Taipei, Taiwan, is giving new life to bottle caps, food packaging, old toys, and other kinds of plastic waste. The Zero Waste Workshop, known as Trash Kitchen, gives people hands-on experience in the recycling process. People take plastic waste, then soften and shape it into a pair of sunglasses within two hours. Arthur Wong started the company that holds the workshop. He spoke to Reuters News Agency. He said, What we are trying to show in the trash kitchen is to let you see, feel, touch within minutes how this process can actually work without secondary pollution, and you can actually turn it into something of value directly in front of you. Wang is the founder of MiniWiz. The company recycles waste material into goods that people want to buy. MiniWiz also produces tiles, bricks, hangers, and other daily necessities from plastic and organic waste. Wang said the company uses a machine it developed in 2017 called a mini trash presso. The machine processes the waste material for a new use. Cora Shea is editor-in-chief for fashion magazine Harper's Bazaar Taiwan. Shea said the project making sunglasses is a good way to bring attention to sustainable fashion. I think environmental protection and fashion still have a long way to go. As for consumers, it is important for them to get first-hand experience, so a workshop like this is very helpful, she said. People taking part in the workshop said it made them think twice about producing trash and made them pay more attention to reusable goods. I have two children. I need to think about their future, said business owner Debbie Wu. If you throw away trash without thinking, you kick the problem down the road. So if everyone can do their best, recycle and use less plastic, that will make a big difference, Wu said. Data from the Ministry of Environment estimates that Taiwan produced a record 11.6 million metric tons of waste in 2023. More than 6 million tons of that waste was recyclable. I'm John Russell. One of the most popular foods in South Korea is kimchi. It is a kind of fermented cabbage or other vegetables. Now, farmers, manufacturers, and scientists say climate change is affecting the quality and quantity of the Napa cabbage used to make the dish. Cabbage grows best in cooler climates. Growers usually plant it in mountainous areas where temperatures during the summer growing season used to stay mostly below 25 degrees Celsius. Studies show that warmer weather tied to climate change is now threatening these crops. There may even come a time when it will be too hot for South Korea to be able to grow Napa cabbage. Lee Young-gyo studies diseases that attack plants. 
He said, the best temperatures for cabbage are between 18 and 21 degrees Celsius. In the fields and in kitchens, both in factories and homes, farmers and kimchi makers are already feeling the change. Spicy fermented kimchi is made from other vegetables such as radish, cucumber, and green onion, but the most popular form is still mostly cabbage. The Agriculture Ministry calls Li Haiyan a kimchi master because of her knowledge of kimchi. She said that in higher temperatures, the heart of the cabbage goes bad and the root softens. If this continues, then in the summertime, we might have to give up cabbage kimchi, said Lee. The government statistics agency reports the area of highland cabbage farmed last year was about 4,000 hectares. That is less than half of what it was 20 years ago. The Rural Development Administration, a state farming organization, predicts that the farmed area for Napa cabbage will shrink in the next 25 years to just 44 hectares. They expect there will be no cabbage grown in the highlands by 2090. Researchers point to three reasons for such a small area of crops. They include higher temperatures, unpredictable heavy rains, and unwanted insects and diseases that become more difficult to control in the warmer and longer summers. South Korea's kimchi industry is already fighting lower-priced imports from China, which are mostly served in restaurants. Those imports rose by almost 7% for the year through the end of July. That is the highest level ever. The government is trying to prevent high prices and shortages by storing large amounts of cabbage. Scientists are also racing to develop crop varieties that can grow in warmer climates, handle changes in rainfall, and resist fungal infections. 71-year-old Kim Sige is a farmer who has worked in the cabbage fields of the eastern region of Gangneung all his life. Kim fears these varieties will be more costly to grow, and they might not taste the same. When we see the reports that there will come a time in Korea when we can no longer grow cabbage, it was shocking on the one hand, and also sad at the same time, Kim said. Kimchi is something we cannot not have on the table. What are we going to do if this happens? I'm Jill Robbins. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Yutaro in Japan about how to summarize what you hear or read. Dear teacher, I enjoy listening to VOA Learning English every night. I have a question about summarizing. How do I summarize a speech? paper, or other text I've listened to. I have to improve my summary skills to pass the upcoming entrance exam. Thank you for writing to us, Yutaro. I'm happy to answer this question. Summarize is the verb form of the word summary. A summary briefly explains the main ideas of a piece of writing or a speech, but does not include all the details. It is often only one or two paragraphs long. Being able to summarize is a useful skill to have, not only for passing exams, but also for working in professions. To summarize well, you need to separate the main ideas from less important details. You can use the following method to do this. First, 
read or listen to the material one time without writing any notes. This will help your mind focus on understanding the ideas. Next, read or listen again. But this time, write notes and be sure to identify the main ideas along with some details. You can mark main ideas by putting a star next to them, underlining them, or using a colored pen to mark them. Next, take a separate piece of paper and try to write only the main ideas. Then, decide which details are necessary to include so that the main ideas are clear. Remember, in a summary, you cannot include every detail. This is sometimes difficult to do at first and requires careful thought. If you can, let a few hours pass between the time when you first take notes and the time when you write the main ideas. This is a good way to see if you can remember and organize the main points in your mind. You can also try the following method to prepare a summary. Try to explain the material as if you were talking about it with your friends or family. In those situations, you would naturally just focus on the main ideas and possibly add a few important details. Practice explaining the ideas by speaking out loud. When you speak, you will probably discover the things you can explain clearly and those things you need to check again. Finally, you can write the summary, keeping in mind the way you presented the main ideas when you spoke about them. For our readers and listeners, do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at Learning English at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Andrew Smith. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give examples, notes on usage, and sometimes use them in short conversations. Today, we talk about an expression that sounds very serious and dangerous. A dead giveaway. A giveaway is just as it sounds. You give something to someone else. But a dead giveaway has nothing to do with tragedy or death. In this expression, the word dead has another meaning you might not have known about. In some common usages, the adjective dead can mean exact, correct, or complete. For example, if someone is dead right, they are completely correct, and there is no doubt about it. And if someone is dead wrong, they are totally wrong. In some trades, the word dead is a really good thing. For example, when something is dead center, it is exactly at the center. In building, dead level means perfectly horizontal, just what you want. However, you never say dead plum. Plum already means perfectly vertical. So, a dead giveaway is a detail or action that gives away the truth completely and totally. It is like a clue that answers a question. A dead giveaway shows a truth, fact, or intention in an obvious way. 
In other words, a dead giveaway leaves little room for misunderstanding. Now let's hear the expression in some examples. A completely dark house and a huge pile of mail outside the door were two dead giveaways that no one had been home in quite some time. She said that she was staying home for the night, but with all the makeup on her face, her hair styled, and her party clothes on, her appearance was a dead giveaway. She was clearly going out. The expression on his face was a dead giveaway that he was guilty. He couldn't even look me in the eyes. English has another expression that is similar. A telltale sign is an important detail or fact that clarifies the truth. It gives more supporting evidence. We often pair telltale with the words sign or symptom. Let's hear some examples. Well, my friend has missed work all week and hasn't responded to my calls. Those may be telltale symptoms of a bigger problem. When the parents returned from their trip, they saw telltale signs everywhere in the house that the children had thrown a party. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 4 Murder had come to the old house on the street called Rue Morgue. Murder had come and gone and left behind the bodies of an old woman and her daughter. It was a perplexing crime scene. The damage to the daughter's body suggested a killer of superhuman strength. The knife that had killed the old woman, almost separating head from body, was in the room. But the old woman's body was outside, behind the house. The door and windows to the house, all firmly closed, locked on the inside. Voices had been heard. One voice was speaking in French. The other voice had not spoken even one word that anyone could understand. And yet, there was no one in the room when police arrived moments after the attack. My friend Dupin was now explaining to me what he had learned when we visited the scene of the crime. I knew that what seemed impossible must be proved possible. The killer, and I believe there was just one, escaped through one of these windows. After the murderer had left, he could have closed the window from the outside, but he could not have fastened the nail. Yet anyone could see the nails which held the windows tightly closed. This was the fact that stopped the police. How could the murderer put the nail back in its place? That's the problem, Dupin. Perhaps, perhaps if you pulled out the nail? Yes, that is just what I thought. Two things seemed clear. First, there had to be something wrong with the idea that the nails were holding the windows closed. Second, if it was not the nails which were holding the windows closed, then something else was holding them closed, something hard to see, something hidden. So I checked the first window again. I removed the nail. Then I again tried to raise the window. It was still firmly closed. There had to be a hidden lock, I thought, inside the window. I searched the window frame. 
Indeed, I found a button which, when I pressed it, opened an inner lock. I raised the window with ease. Now I knew that the killer could close the window from outside and the window would lock itself. But there was still the nail. So I returned the nail, pressed the button, and again tried to raise the window. The nail held the window closed. Then the window could not have been the means of escape. That window, no. The killer did not escape through it. But I went again to the other window. The nail there looked the same as the one I had just seen. I moved the bed so that I could look closely. Yes, there was a button here too. I was so sure I was right that without touching the nail, I pressed the button and tried to raise the window. And guess what happened? I knew the answer, but I let Dupin have the satisfaction of reporting. The window went up, he told me. As the window went up, it carried with it the top part of the nail, the head. When I closed the window, the head of the nail was again in its place. It looked just as it had looked before. The nail was broken, but looked whole. And what is impossible is proved otherwise. So the murderer went out that window. Did he arrive in the room by that path as well? Dupin answered, although it seemed he was speaking more to himself than to me. It was a hot summer night. Would the victim have opened the window to get some fresh night air? Most likely. So the killer found it open and entered, I said. Dupin nodded. And as he came in, the window locked when it closed. The lock held the window closed, not the nail, as it appeared to investigators. Again, that which seemed impossible was actually possible. Dupin's eyes were shining with the satisfaction discovery brings. He was analyzing evidence, and his unusual reasoning ability had found a great purpose. I suddenly understood. This is why going to the house on the Rue Morgue seemed pleasing to Dupin. The use of his sharp mental abilities made him happy. And I had more work to provide that great brain. Dupin, the windows are on the fourth floor, far above the ground. Even an open window. Dupin shook his head up and down slowly. Yes, yes, that is an interesting question. How did the murderer go from the window down to the ground and vice versa? But I had looked around carefully outside, you recall, and I knew a way. And the answer to this question told me still more about the identity of the killer. Do you remember, friend, the lightning rod attached to the house? E yes, yes. A metal pole, and quite narrow. It protects the building from lightning strikes. But it is so tall and, and thin. True. It would take great strength and agility to get up the pole. Some kinds of animals might climb it easily, yes? But surely not every man could. In fact, maybe very few men. Those of very special strength and special training. This helped create a better picture of the murderer, but still not sharp enough to recognize. I still had the question, who? We know the killer climbed the pole, entered the room through the window, murdered and destroyed all order in the room. He managed to push one body up the chimney. He threw the other, almost headless, out the window. Then he left the way he came, 
we can answer the how of the crime, but who? Such unspeakable viciousness. What human could do this to another? Dupin continued, trance-like again, seeming to speak to himself as much as to me. Perhaps we can come closer to answering the question of who by exploring the question of why. But Dupin, the police said the motive must have been robbery. But, my friend, what was taken? The police said they could not answer the question. They said they did not know what the women had. Maybe clothes and jewelry, the investigators proposed. But neighbors described the women as nearly hermits, rarely, if ever, leaving the house. Of what use would fine clothes and costly jewelry be to them? Dupin's eyes were glistening, his brows pointing sharply down, as he circled me, thinking aloud. But what is more telling than what the killer might have taken is what he left behind, conveniently in bags in the center of the room. Of course, the money. You are right, Dupin. It makes no sense. All the money delivered from the bank to the old woman, right there on the floor? Why would the attacker have passed on the riches? A thief certainly would not. So I want you to forget the investigators' claim that the killer acted out of a desire for money. They thought this only because they knew the money had arrived just three days before the killings. But that was just chance. If gold was the reason for the murders, the killer must have been quite a fool to forget and leave it there. No, I think that there was no reason for these killings except, perhaps, fear. The wild nature of the attack leads me to a motive of fear. Hmm, an interesting theory, Dupin. Fear can bring out the crazed beast in a person. In any living thing. Now let us look at the murders themselves. A girl is killed by powerful hands around her neck. Then the body is placed in the opening over the fireplace, head down. Unusual, even by the standards of the most terrible criminals. Think also of the great strength needed to put the body where it was found. It took several men to pull it out. Also, the hair pulled from the head of the old woman. You saw it on the floor yourself, and you saw the blood and skin still attached. It takes great force to pull out even twenty or thirty hairs at a time. But this was hair and scalp. And there was no reason to almost take off the woman's head just to kill her. It is extremely odd, I agree. Especially since there is no evidence that the killer knew the victims. No one could hate a stranger enough to carry out such torture. Dupin's eyes narrowed. Exactly. That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Brian Lynn. 